Good morning, everybody. As Monty Python said, and now for something completely different. So, I'd like to begin with a little anecdote about fire. For many years, I've had a tiny index card in my writing studio by my first mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson, that says, genius is the power for lighting your own fire. Now, you notice he doesn't say, wait for the genius grant by the MacArthur Foundation. And you notice he doesn't say, I'm, I'm waiting for the world to recognize my genius, like B.B. King, when B.B. King sang, nobody loves me but my mama, and she could be jiving too. <laughs> no, creative, passionate people seize life by the throat. They seize the day, they seize the moment. They believe that fire is at the heart of creativity. So what I want to ask you this morning is, what are you doing with your fire? Are you tending it or are you hoarding it, waiting for it, protecting it? You know, there was an amazing old saying by the Vikings that said, whoever hoards the fire and does not pass it on is a thief. This is a way to get into talking about my main theme for the day, which is mentorship. I have found in my work and studying the biographies of hundreds of creative people, from artists to scientists, that those who lead a happy, prolific creative life are those who pass the fire on. So if you're stuck or if your fire is in danger of going out, two things to do. One, be humble enough to take on a mentor, or be compassionate enough to be a mentor to somebody else. I've been passionate about this since I was a kid. Growing up in a world in Detroit, reading with my family, we used to read the classics out loud together, Homer to Mark Twain, and even though I'm reading upside down here, at least I'm reading, right? And from the very beginning, I knew that I wanted to write. As Jack Kerouac once said, a writer is someone who loves to hang around words. And that's been my lifelong dream, to hang around words. And at 16, I got a chance to work on the hometown newspaper found in 1877, the Wayne Dispatch, as a writer and a photographer, and I walked in the first night with all my stories in my notes. And I remember my second mentor, Roger Turner, my editor, saying, Phil, it ain't real till it's ink. In other words, move the idea from here onto the page and make it real. Well, the dream then was to work for a few years there and then move 12 miles down Michigan Avenue to the Paris of the Midwest. This was the nickname for Detroit from the 1930s to the 1960s when it was one of the most culturally diverse, richest, and most art-worthy places in the world. And my dream was to work for the Detroit Free Press and become a storyteller, like I had been doing on the paper, but also like my dad here, as you see him leading people around the River Rouge plant, the great glamour spot of Detroit, telling stories, mythologizing the whole car industry. I was very proud of this, proud to be have my dad as one of the original madmen. You can see him in the upper right-hand corner there. <laughs> if you see it today, the TV show today, it's not a lie. This is how a lot of people grew up in the 1950s. So I was proud of this. It was glamorous to be part of that. I, I love the idea that my dad worked with Lee Iacocca to help launch the Mustang. That's part of the family folklore. So proud of it, but I had to carve out my own path. I had to find my own fire, right, right? And yet, irony of ironies, I got stuck. And because I got stuck early on as a kid in my college years, when my family split up and I had to go and work in one of these factories that I was trying to avoid, I got angry, like a lot of people do, when their, their dream, their vision is stymied, when obstacles are thrown in front of them. And so the first year or so there, I was a mad young kid, an angry young guy, and my foreman, Bob Schneckenberger, who was a Green Beret from Vietnam, he had just come in from Nam, this was 1970, 
He took a look at me and he said, Phil, you're a great young guy, but you need an attitude adjustment. (laughs) He said, it's going to be a long time here, four years, and if you are going to get through it, you're going to need some help. Mentor number three, I see some promise in you, I see a spark in you, but you're going to need some help. And I'm going to offer to help you here. If you get tired, I don't want you to get mutilated by these tremendously forceful machines in the factory. Ask for help. So I learned to ask for help from him early on. This was tough for a young guy. But I did it. And then I followed his second piece of advice. He says, if you want to be a writer, don't stay in Detroit. Go and see the world. And I took that piece of advice and I left for, I thought, three months and I stayed away for about three years. I roamed the back roads of the world. Here I am climbing a date tree. I harvested date trees on a kibbutz in Israel. I ran with the bulls. You see the shadowy guy with a beret in the middle there? I'm running with the bulls in Pamplona. I went to Greece many times, following the footsteps of of Homer and, and the Greek myths that I loved, taking notes, taking notes, writing stories, filing a few here and there, taking photos and filming. Came back three years later, and still wasn't quite ready. And so I painted houses for seven years in San Francisco, 44 Victorians, those great Victorian ladies as they call them, and studying at night, researching, reading, 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 reminiscent of that great line by Abraham Lincoln where he said, I will study and I will be ready when my moment comes. I wasn't quite sure where I was going. My dad at one point even sent me a little note that says, my friends here at Ford Motor Company in Detroit, they're wondering what happened to you? And I don't know what to tell them. What's happened to you, Phil? This is a great test. If you've got some passion and you're not quite sure where it's headed, do you trust that or not? Or you do pull back and take the safe route. Well, I kept going. I read and I read and I read and then after reading some Joe Campbell, Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, Miracle of Miracles, there I am in my house painting gear with flakes of plaster in my hair. I actually got to meet him at a workshop in San Francisco. And Campbell was giving a lecture on the King Arthur legends about how you have to forge your own path to find yourself. This is what he called the hero's journey. It's the road of self knowledge. But if you follow that, beware, and yet have some consolation too, that you are invariably, inevitably going to confront the labyrinth. The labyrinth is the path, it's that spot halfway through any journey that's significant, in which you feel the twists and turns, the confusion, the anxiety that is inevitable if you are pursuing something significant. And the great line, I remember him reciting from memory that day, furthermore, we have not even to risk the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We've only to follow the thread, the thread, listen to that word, the thread of the hero path. And goes on to say, and where you thought to be alone, you will be with all the world because everyone who has been on an adventure has been in the labyrinth. Well, as Emily Dickinson once said, when you've recognized the truth, you feel like the top of your head is coming off, right? Your hair's on fire. This was my story. I thought I was lost there painting houses when I had a college degree and I should be writing for the Free Press in Detroit. And yet, Campbell, like all great mentors, gave me the courage of my conviction that I was actually on a path called the hero's journey. And for the next few years, I looked at every movie, every book, every biography in this pattern of the hero journey, which is a counterclockwise path. It's not clockwise. The clockwise path is the path that everybody else is on. But if you have a dream, if you have a vision that is unique, if you have a fire, you're going to find yourself going against the grain, going against the wind, as my main man, Bob Seeger from Detroit, used to sing. And you will find yourself moving through a threshold down into a night world where if you are smart and humble, you will take on a muse or a mentor to give you the strength and the compassion to move through that labyrinth. 
you keep moving, you see some kind of treasure, which is always the symbol for wisdom, some kind of self-knowledge. And if you're selfless, you bring that boon, that treasure back home again. And as Campbell told me, when I showed him what I was doing with this model to help me um, understand movies and actually get my first major job, my first break with the American Film Institute, teaching screenwriting, teaching myth in the movies. He said, Phil, this is great. You see, I've cleaned up a little bit in five years here. <laughs> it's at the National Arts Club in New York. He said, this is great, but make it your own. Do you notice the magnificent music we just heard? This is someone who has made it her own. This is distinctive music. That is the, the uh, litmus test for genius, that the gift, the music, the art, the writing, the poetry is unmistakable. It could be nobody else's. And Joe Campbell gave me that, that signature, make it your own. And then he also said the line that's on a lot of bumper stickers right now. You may have one on your, your Corvette if you're driving American these days. He says, follow your bliss and doors will ha open where there were no doors before. Remember that famous line? Well, I literally had the doors open for me. I had a chance to work with John Densmore, the drummer for the doors, <laughs> for five years, helping him work on his biography, his life with Jim Morrison and the doors. And although it's great fun to learn the landscape of, the, of rock and roll history, to hang out with rock and roll cats for five years in, in LA, my most vivid and helpful message out of five years of working with the doors was this. John, Ray, Robbie, Danny Sugarman, the manager, one night we're all sitting together at Duke's, the famous uh, rock and roll restaurant on, on Sunset Boulevard. And Danny's saying, you know, what hurts most about Jim Morrison dying at 27 is that he didn't have to go down. He didn't have to be burned and torched by that fire. He didn't have to lead that self-destructive myth. If he had only reached out and asked for some help, if he had had a mentor, we would still be playing music today. And then I remember John pulling back and saying, yeah, like the Grateful Dead. <laughs> the great rivals for the doors in those early years. So the, the, that mention again and again of the mentor brings up this issue. What is it? I love the story behind the idea of the mentor. When Odysseus goes off to war to fight the Trojans, he has the wherewithal, as we used to say in Detroit, to TCB, take care of business. He's just become a father. And he does not want to leave his father alone. So he turns to his best friend, whose name is Mentor. In Greek, Mentor means mind maker. Very different from the Eastern tradition of the guru who says, don't th you don't have to think for yourself, but lead a life like mine. Uh, we're in a venerable old tradition here. The Western tradition comes right out of this idea that the mentor is there to help you make up your own mind, to help you find your unique path, your unique voice. And so mentor helps raise Telemachus, Odysseus' son. In Greek, Telemachus is teleos machia, and that means the end of war. So the beauty of this whole model is that the mentor is there to help you channel your fury as a young person, help you sublimate all of that energy that's pouring through you as a young person into music, into sports, into art. Move it, keep it moving. Many models for this. We had George Lucas work with us when I ultimately got the chance to actually co-write the movie about Campbell's life, The Hero's Journey, we brought George Lucas with his girlfriend at the time, Linda Ronstadt here, in to give a tribute about Campbell. And, and he said, I would still be writing Star Wars today if I hadn't found Joe Campbell in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Joe Campbell is my Yoda. <laughs> it was a great line we were able to use in the film. <clears throat> the Grateful Dead said, we've been making music for 25 years. We didn't know what we were doing until we met Joe Campbell. Sometimes the mentor comes after the fact and tells you what you've actually been doing for a number of years. So many models for this. Alexander the Great's mentor was actually Aristotle, which I find amazing. Jane Goodall has been very honest and forthcoming, crediting herself not just in a sense from being self-born, but she said when she was in Africa, Louis Leakey gave her the courage of her convictions to follow her path. 
and on and on it goes. Successful, prolific people will always welcome the opportunity to talk about how someone recognized their spark, their genius, fanned their flames. Spielberg and Kubrick, Harry Potter and his many mentors. And for me, to emphasize one of the main themes of the conference here, passion and making the difference, the two roads diverge in the yellow wood, as Robert Frost famously said, but the one in our culture that's much less traveled is the one that says, I need some help. It's very hard, especially for men, I've noticed, and it's not just asking for directions. <laughs> if you're 40 and male and you don't have all the answers, <clears throat> you feel like a failure in this culture. But what I've discovered is that people who ask for help when they're young and then at major junctures throughout their life can continue to lead a productive, valuable, contributing life. Eventually, I adapted the hero's journey model into the creative journey. And this is what I've been using in my own work for every project. I put up a wheel like this on my wall. Twyla Tharp, the choreographer, 199 dances she's choreographed. She puts up a circle like this on her wall to help chart where she is, taking the inspiration down into perspiration. You take a muse and mentor on to help you through those dark nights of the soul. And eventually, you bring the gift or the boon back and ideally make some kind of contribution. So it's helped me. I've produced a number of books and films, but over and over again, I credit my mentors for keeping me going because I feel like each book and film should be easier. It's never <laughs> easier if you want to get better, if you want to plunge deeper into your creative spark. It's always a little harder, but there is a way to keep moving by asking for help, going to someone, writing a letter to someone you admire, a famous writer or actor, sometimes even um, contemplating someone early on, like a James Joyce, who may have inspired you when you were very young. A couple quick examples then. Um, a number of years ago, someone took one of my classes on creativity, stoking the creative fire, and came up to me afterwards and said that he had been a bomber pilot. He had actually been involved in the carpet bombing of Dresden, and he had always felt terrible about what he had done. He felt he needed to write about it. He had tried and tried for years, but it just wasn't happening. So we worked through this, and we discovered that he also admired a young pilot who had gone over to join the Allies and help defeat the Axis powers in the war, a young guy named Bert Stiles. And this Bob's admiration for him was so profound. I said, why don't you write about him? If you get to the bottom of his story, it may help you tell your own. He ended up writing four books about this young fella. The main one still in print, Serenade to a Blue Lady. And it's a, there are a good lesson here in that sometimes you just need to shift 10 degrees off to the side. If you're writing a poem and you're stuck, maybe it should be a song. If you're writing a novel and you're stuck, maybe it should be a play. Jaime Lerner, an architect who reluctantly became a mayor because he wanted to transform his town of Curitiba, Brazil into the first green city in all of South America. And he said something very profound when we were interviewing him for a film we did, Ecological Designs, uh, The Sustainable Future. He said, do not wait for one more study. Do not wait for more money. Do not wait for the powers that be to tell you how brilliant you are. You do not have the right to wait if you have a real vision. So he went out and he became mayor and, and enacted a number of profound laws which helped turn a city of 700,000 people living in slums into the first green city in South America. And then to, to wrap up here, um, Sometimes you're not even sure where your story is going to go, but you have to write it anyway. I needed one more story to flesh out my book, The Book of Roads, and I found a little tale in the magazine that Mary Leakey, the daughter of Louis Leakey, had found a series of footprints by a man, a woman, and a child, 17 feet long, covered over by lava. Apparently, they had been running away from a lava flow in Tanzania. 
And this was called the oldest road in the world. And I loved that idea, the oldest, 3.7 million years old. Isn't that amazing? So I wrote this story and something miraculous happened. You know, James Serber once said, I don't know what I think until I read what I have to say. That's what happened here. I'm writing this and suddenly I remember walking in my dad's footsteps when I was a kid. So I'm writing that, feeling a little sentimental, and I suddenly remember my son, Jack, walking in my footsteps. So I write that, and then I'm thinking, this is a little sentimental, but oh, what the hell, I really feel passionate about this. So I published it, and shortly after, I got a phone call from a guy who said, this is the dude, who's no, this is the dude. I love this story, this is my story. This is everybody's story. You follow in the footsteps of your parents and your elders and your teachers, and then you look behind you, and you see other people following in your footsteps. And you realize everybody has to make their own tracks eventually. Call me, call me. So it was a cool call, but I said, I let it go. He calls the next day. This is the dude, call me. He calls me the next day. This is the dude, call me. This was Jeff Dowd, who's the inspiration for the dude in The Big Lebowski. <laughs> Not the dude, the dude. <laughs> So the moral of the story there is, follow that hunch that you have some unique fire that no one else in the world has. If you follow that, you're humble enough to take the advice, to take the direction, to take the, the affirmation from a mentor, then be smart enough to focus that fire. Focus that fire until you can actually hold something in your hand that you're proud of, that you can stand by with complete conviction. And then finally, pass the torch to the next generation. Thank you very much.